the, uh, the lecture is called The Politics of Dissent, uh, Radha Binod Pal and the Tokyo War Crimes Trial with a preface on the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal. Um, and we're gonna begin with some, uh, some images here. So this is a Yasukuni shrine. Uh, the Yasukuni shrine is in Tokyo and it's a shrine that uh, uh, is, so what's the best way to describe it? It's a sacred Shinto shrine, uh, but it's very controversial, extremely controversial because it basically honors uh, Japanese uh, military war heroes and personnel. Um, and it's uh, a shrine that, um, if I may use this word, is viewed as sacred almost. Uh, by the by the Japanese right wing. Uh, so one of the reasons it's very controversial is that in most years, the Japanese prime minister goes there every year um, and he kind of pays his, you know, respects to the war dead, to their spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, there are East Asian countries uh, such as China and Korea, which take offense at this. Uh, and this, of course, has to do with the uh, the Japanese prosecution of the war in World War II, uh, but even before that with Japanese war crimes in Manchuria and Nanking um, and elsewhere. Um, so this is the reason why it's controversial. Uh, the J Japanese prime minister has often been advised not to do that, uh, but in most years, perhaps in all years, the Japanese prime minister usually will go there once a year at least to pay his respects. So this is, uh, it's, it's in Tokyo. Um, and, um, you know, you will see a number of memorials there at, at this particular shrine and, uh, and, you know, some of some are quite simple. Some have, some have elaborate war panels or panels of uh, depicting a Japanese wartime activity or what, you know, uh, what officers and soldiers may be doing at the time of battle, just giving you a little sense of little flavor of the place. Before we move to uh, the principal slides, which come up after this that I want to share with you. Um, so here is this man here. <clears throat> uh, this, is, this shrine is ex exceedingly unusual because it's the only, sh uh, the, 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 well, this memorial is exceedingly unusual because it's the only memorial at this entire complex, which is dedicated to a gaijin, uh, a foreigner. Okay, um, and who is this man? This is an Indian judge. Uh, his name is Radha Binot Pal. Uh, uh, we'll encounter some of his views in greater detail uh, later on. Uh, so he was a justice uh, who sat on the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal. And again, I'll explain that uh, in due course of time. But what is very unusual when you go to the Yasukuni Shrine uh, is to see this particular memorial uh, because as I said, it's the only one dedicated to um, a person who is not a Japanese. Uh, and uh, we'll get a better sense of why he's revered in this particular fashion uh, in Japan, okay? So, um, and just so that you have a sense of where this is within the complex, of course, I mean, you're only seeing a minuscule portion of this huge complex, but here's another uh, memorial over here. You see, you see, uh, uh, you know, a uh, 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 ship here. So this is a warship, and and so this would be to this would be a memorial to those who served, you know, on a particular warship or perhaps soldiers. Uh, but you can see the location of the of the memorial to Paul in relation to this one over here. And once again, uh, another image of him, a little little closer up. And there's a plaque, obviously, in in, in Japanese, which explains to visitors who he was uh, and portions of his judgment here and then a plaque uh, in English as well, uh, right? Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, again in the, in the same area, but just because now you get a sense of the stature in which he's held. So this is a memorial monument to the, the Toko pilots. So uh, the Toko pilots, uh, what we're talking about, you, many of you have heard of them. These are the suicide pilots, uh, the Japanese, uh, uh, the for, in Japanese, a formal term for units carrying out these suicide attacks, which took place between 44 and 45, uh, is uh, Tobuketsu Kogek 
Kikatai, which literally means a special attack unit. Uh, and this is usually abbreviated as Tokotai. So that's why they're called the Toko pilots. And that's the monument. And here you see actually the real monument here. All right. <clears throat> so one, uh, one uh, further thing that I'm trying to develop in this uh, little presentation for day, today uh, is to also give you a sense of how countries commemorate uh, their own war dead, right? That's a crucial point. Uh, believe it or not, I once took an entire course as a graduate student uh, called War and Its Representations, which was entirely just a study of war memorials uh, around the world. Because you might think that war memorials around the world and memorials which commemorate martyrs are you know, identical everywhere. Well, they're not uh, for all kinds of reasons because they're particular cultural inflections. Um, so this is itself one way in which one can study uh, the culture of a country, uh, do cultural history, as well as study the military culture of a country is to look at how it remembers uh, its, its martyrs, its soldiers, its generals. Um, you know, the whole idea of the tomb of the unknown soldier, for example, uh, which really became prominent um, during the World War I period and after because there were millions of soldiers who died who couldn't get a burial. And very often their identities weren't even known, their bodies weren't even claimed. Uh, so if you go to Europe, uh, Western Europe, you go to Flanders, to Belgium, Netherlands, France, uh, Britain, all of these places, you'll see them all over, all over the landscape, the tomb of the unknown soldier, right? Uh, of course, that also denotes a certain idea of sacrifice and all of that, right? Uh, now this, now rather just as Radha Vinod Pal, you can, you can, uh, uh, gauge his importance in Japan by virtue of the fact that not only is he the only foreigner really represented at Yasukuni Shrine, um, where the other martyrs are all Japanese generals and military heroes and, and the like, um, and, and some politicians uh, as well, uh, you can uh, gauge the importance of Radha Binod Pal by virtue of the fact that there is another memorial to him, uh, which is actually in Kyoto. So this is at the Ryozen Goku Shrine, which enshrines the national martyrs of the Sino-Japanese, Russo-Japanese, and Great Asia-Pacific Wars. The Great Asia-Pacific War is World War II, which is how it's often referred to as a Great Asia-Pacific War um, in Japan. And at the Yasukuni Shrine, there is actually a, 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 a museum as well, uh, in that same complex. Um, I visited the museum. Uh, I, don't, I don't know Japanese other than a few words, but I visited um, uh, you know, a few years ago and my, my guide was a very eminent Japanese scholar whom I knew um, and who has worked on Rava Binod Pal. And I myself am working on him, which is one reason I have all of this material because these, all these images you've seen are, are photographs that I took when I was uh, there in 2016, uh, looking at this, uh, the looking at the question of uh, Rava Binod Pal's uh, status in Japan um, and how the Japanese view him, you know, right? So uh, th this uh, shrine uh, is in fact, actually the shrine in Kyoto is in fact actually older than the Yasukune shrine, uh, but the Yasukune shrine is now in a way the national uh, shrine for uh, you know, the war dead, uh, particularly the war dead of a certain stature. Um, so here you, here you see once again, you notice it's the same photograph uh, because it's basically the photograph of Radha Binod Pal when he was a judge of the, at the military tribunal in Tokyo. Um, and this slide here shows you uh, the larger memorial. So it's quite a large memorial. And then you can see all along here so there's the, 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 you know, these are passages, the, partly it's a history of the tr tribunal and then there's passages from his judgment, which we will talk about in due course of time. Um, and here, just a close up uh, of Radha Binod Pal. So now before we get back to, and you know, there is, a, as I said, again, a little bit in English as well. Uh, the bulk of the descriptions are all in Japanese, but then you get, uh, usually at least uh, one plaque uh, 
uh, which gives you um, something in English for those who are non-Japanese speakers. Um, so now, before we get to the Tokyo War Crimes Trial, because this uh, talk is not only on the Tokyo War Crimes Trial, it's really on the idea of um, international justice. How does one bring to justice war criminals? Who exactly are war criminals? You know, uh, when the United States went to war uh, with Iraq, uh, and they were left-wing left -wing activists in this country or liberal activists who took the view that this was an illegal war. Uh, some of them argued that George Bush should have been tried as a war criminal. Uh, now, I think that many people will balk at this suggestion. They'll say, well, there's a big difference between George Bush and, and Adolf Hitler, who was also a war criminal, obviously. And I'm not trying to suggest uh, at all, the equivalence between the two. I'm just saying that, well, who exactly really is a war criminal? Um, and how does one, and how does one uh, understand what is uh, a war crime, right? What are crimes committed during war? Because notice that if there is such a charge, we also understand that during uh, the time of war, uh, countries will do things which are not permissible uh, in peacetime and that there are acts that are going to be excused during war, particularly, quote, if they are unintentional. So when, let me give you a very simple illustration, going back again to um, the US and the war with Iraq, right? Um, and the attempt to, to capture Saddam Hussein, right? So uh, uh, at this time, again, the, the question is that when the Americans were bombing, Iraq, they were civilian casualties. Now, of course, the people who planned the war and the bombing said, well, these are completely unintentional. And in fact, at, it is really at this time that the phrase was invented, collateral damage. So civilian deaths were simply dismissed as collateral damage. Well, this is the damage that happens completely unintentional when a legitimate war is being pursued and of course, the Americans claimed that they were taking all the measures they could possibly take to actually minimize civilian casualties. It is also necessary to say that most countries will make the same argument. So this argument is not particular um, to the Americans. All right. Um, and then there could be other kinds of collateral damage. So one of the things that happened was the looting of the National Museum in Baghdad. And you know that. Um, uh, Iraq, also known in earlier times as Mesopotamia, has some of the oldest antiquities in the world, right? Because Mesopotamia is, of course, one of the sites of the earliest civilizations in history. Uh, and there was mass scale looting. And the then Department of uh, Defense, the Secretary of Defense uh, in the United States was Donald Rumsfeld. And when he was told about it, he simply, his simple answer was two words, which I'll never forget the rest of my life. He said, stuff happens, stuff happens. So, well, you know, look, we can't, there's nothing we can do about something like this. So it's a complex set of issues. That's what I'm trying to, trying to indicate. Now, following the end of World War II, the victorious allies, of course, decided that they were going to put on trial high-level politicians, military officials, and a few others. When I say a few others, I mean, for example, in the case of Nazi Germany, a few businessmen who had been working very closely with the Nazi wartime regime, uh, close associates of Hitler, people who funded, as it were, the Nazi project to some degree, right? So that the decision was that these people would all be put on a trial for war crimes and wartime atrocities. Uh, but this is not something that was thought only at the end of the war. I mean, plans had been made for this, first made for this in 1942. So that, that when the war comes to an end, we're probably going to have to undertake some such action to uh, um, you know, suggest uh, to future generations that officials who carry out atrocities will not be excused for their conduct, okay? 
So the U US, UK, France, and the Soviet Union. So we're talking about the four major allied um, um, powers. Uh, it's really three, frankly, if you ask me, because France, as you know, uh, was not really a very major player. Paris fell, uh, France fell to the, 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 the Germans. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't really see much as, by the way, what I would call Fra French intervention, comparatively speaking. Uh, but of course, nonetheless, when war was declared by Germany, it was declared by on uh, September 1st, or was it September 3rd, 1939? It was declared on France and the United Kingdom. The United States, as all of you know, uh, entered into the war much later on. And that, that was after the December uh, 1941 bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, until that time, the US was not um, involved in the Second World War, right? So the US, UK, France, and Soviet Union set up the International Mil Military Tribunal in Nuremberg and then one in Tokyo. Why Nuremberg? So Nuremberg is the site um, of some of the major rallies carried out by the Nazis. Uh, uh, there's a very, very famous German filmmaker uh, of that time who made documentaries which are masterworks of cinema, but she was basically a propagandist for the Nazi regime, Leni Reifenstahl. Uh, so, you know, if you see some of her films, you will see the, the parade ground in Nuremberg, it's still there. Um, uh, Nuremberg is a city in Bavaria. Um, I was there about 25 years ago. And so I still remember this massive parade ground where these rallies were held. So, the, so Nuremberg was in a way, one of the originary sites of uh, Nazism, and that's one reason among others, symbolically, why they decided to hold the tribunal there. Um, and this tribunal was going to try major war criminals uh, of the European Axis power. So, based, but which in principle meant not just Germany, but also meant meant Italy. But it was really German war criminals that were going to be put on trial. Uh, and then they were going to have a military tribunal. They decided in Tokyo, and this was for going to be obviously for um, the war criminals uh, in what the Japanese called the Great Asia Pacific War, right? Um, this IMT was set up by London, an agreement that was signed in London in 1945, even though discussions had been taking place since 1942. Um, and the signatories were not only the four major allied powers, but 20 some other countries, um, including Greece, Denmark, India, Netherlands, and so on. All right. Now, um, uh, uh, what is the charter? So the International Military Tribunal had a charter um, and the charter lays down the terms for how the tribunal is going to proceed uh, and what are gonna be some of the, uh, of the uh, you know, parameters of its mandate, right? So it, it had one judge from each allied power and a prosecution team for each country. Let me just explain that very briefly. What I mean by that is, so the US, for example, will send one judge, uh, the United Kingdom will send one judge and so on. And each judge and each country actually has a prosecution team to assist it in the prosecution of a case. Uh, why each country had its own prosecution team partly had to do with the nature of the crimes, the fact that the war was spread over a large uh, territory, that all of these countries had certain vested interests. They had their own ideas of how the trial should be carried out. Uh, and they had different archives of evidence, so to speak, right? And so the idea was that they would all have an equal hand in the prosecution of this trial. And the charter furnished the intermediate International Military Tribunal or IMT with the authority to try and punish persons who had committed any of the following crimes, right? And then now the crimes are listed. This is, uh, I would suggest that this will of course be posted that you, you read th this very carefully because the critical thing here is that these crimes, crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity are essentially new crimes under international law. 
all right? Now, by this, I don't mean to say that there had not been international conventions before this tribunal, which had governed the prosecution of international law. For example, there were certain protocols that were in place about the fact that civilians should be spared, right? The attacks, they should be spared the burdens of bombing. S civilians cannot be taken hostage, right? Now there, there are rules and regulations governing war, the prosecution of war. But nonetheless, this was far more wider in scope, these charges and any that had ever actually been proposed before. So for example, crimes against peace, namely planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements or assurances or participation in a common plan or conspiracy. Right, so how does one establish that there's a conspiracy that Germany entered into with other countries or that a number of Germans entered into a conspiracy among each other? What exactly is a conspiracy? Then we need a legal definition of conspiracy. These are all very complicated questions. So uh, the question here simply was that the tribunal took upon itself a mandate which was really not simply very wide ranging in scope, but unprecedented because many of these quote crimes against humanity had never been designated as such before. And you will see of course very soon the implications of this and why some people, even people who actually had no doubt that the Germans had committed crimes nonetheless said, well, there are some problems in how these charges are being framed. So the first allegation was that this was actually Victor's trial. Churchill himself admitted, the British wartime prime minister, right? You always voted in Britain as the greatest um, um, person in English history because he's the one who carried Britain during World War II through um, uh, a period uh, uh, when Britain was faced with the greatest threat to its identity I, and its integrity as a country. So Churchill himself admitted that had the Germans won, they would most likely have put the allied powers on trial for war crimes. Right? Now, of course, that's not the story that one hears on the American side, because usually in America, this is remembered as the good war, the good war, right? This is unlike, let's say, the Vietnam War, this is remembered as a good war that, you know, we were on the good side, no question about it. Um, but Churchill's saying, well, you know, there were crimes committed by the United Kingdom, by the United States he himself is admitting that, right? By the allies. And now we're putting them on trial because we won the war. But had they won the war, there's no question that they would have reversed the tables, right? So what crimes did the allies commit? Most notoriously, you could say the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, of course, some would dispute that. And this is where I won't get into it, this discussion because I have it in the blog essays, I have it in the other video recorded lectures um, that, you know, it's, it's been argued that, well, one thing that Hiroshima did was it prevented the necessity of what would be a protracted land war, that is a, a American invasion of Japan and this would have resulted in a much greater number of casualties than what um, happened at Hiroshima and then Nagasaki, because as all of you know, there were two bombs that were dropped on August 6th and August 9th, uh, 1945. Um, and by the way, the Americans only had two bombs. The Japanese didn't know that. So, um, you know, they didn't have a third and a fourth bomb that they could have dropped at, at that time. So, but the point here is that, that I am fully aware of the fact that some people would dispute whether the atomic bombing should be considered a war crime or not. Uh, of course, as, as, uh, there are plenty of people on the other side, such as myself, who would take that view. Uh, but, but we are not called upon here to take a view on whether it is a war crime or not. We're simply called upon to understand what have been some of the criticism. Then, apart from the, the atomic bombings, there is the Allied bombings of Germany, and in particular of Dresden. Because here the critical question is, 
were these wartime necessities or not? So uh, the, 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 the bombing of Japanese cities. And when I'm talking about the Jap bombing of Japanese cities, I'm not talking about the atomic bombing. I'm talking about the, the bombing of virtually every city in Japan, barring Hiroshima and Nagasaki, by the Americans for months. You know? I mean, most of Tokyo had already been burnt to the ground before the atomic bombing. And one of the things I mentioned in my blog essay is that one reason why Hiroshima uh, became the target is that the Americans had left a number of cities untouched. They left them untouched precisely because they wanted to get an indic they wanted to understand what would be the impact of the bomb, right? Since this was something new. Now, if you throw the bomb um, on a city that's already completely destroyed, you can't judge its impact. So in the, in the preceding months when they had carried out what is called the carpet bombing or the fire bombing of Japanese cities, and by the way, Japanese cities burn a little bit easier uh, than, uh, than cities elsewhere, because you know if you've ever been to Japan and you know the traditional Japanese homes, especially wood and even paper, okay? Um, um, of course, uh, you know, not paper in the ordinary sense in which you understand it, but something that is combustible very easily, right? Uh, what, what we are saying here is that there is uh, an argument that has been made by many, many historians and people who have looked at this, that some of these bombings were not a wartime necessity, okay? Um, and, and even with respect to Germany, so Dresden was a great uh, cultural center. Uh, there's a massive literature on the bombing of Dresden and to what extent it was a necessity or not, what were the deliberations that took place, right? So were some of the bombings actually undertaken to inflict terror rather than to simply uh, defeat the enemy or to take out military installations? Were they intended to set an example, right? Were they intended to give a warning to those in that country that if you resist, this is what's in store for you, okay, right? Were civilians not killed by both sides intentionally? See, these are some of the questions that have come up when we look at the question of Victor's trial. German atrocities are public knowledge, right? What happened in the concentration camps? I mean, one would have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to have some sense of uh, the scale of the atrocities committed by the Germans, particularly, of course, the Holocaust, right? Um, the, the persecution uh, of Jews and, um, and when we're talking about persecution eventually leading to extermination or attempted extermination of, of the entire Jewish population. Uh, and of course, there were other groups that were targeted, uh, as I have pointed out, many other historians have uh, homosexuals, people who were viewed as mentally unstable or deranged. Um, you know, the Roma or the gypsies, all of these people were targeted as well, right? However, let's take the other side for a moment. There is overwhelming evidence that German women at the end of the war by, were raped by US, British, French, and Soviet troops. Because you know, of course, that, that Germany was carved up into zones um, and all the allied uh, forces had a hand in uh, what would transpire in Germany at the end of the war. Now, initially, initial research some decades ago placed the number of rapes of German women by American soldiers at 11,000. But in 2015, there is a book that comes out by a German feminist historian, uh, Miriam Gebhardt, where she says that as many as 190,000 German women were raped by American soldiers in the few months following the US invasion of Nazi Germany. I can assure you, by the way, that 90, 9% of Americans have never even heard of the rape of German women by American troops, which is widely acknowledged by people who have worked on it. There's now a, this question about how, how widespread was this? Did it take place on that scale that she claims or was it on a smaller scale? Not that 11,000 is insignificant, not by the remotest imagination, 
right? Uh, because of course, you could say that, well, you know, this was, this was the be behavior of drunken soldiers. Uh, some American soldiers were enraged by what they saw when the liberation, when the concentration camps were liberated, right? And when they walked into the concentration camps and saw the, the scale of what had transpired there, they were just absolutely enraged. But if you're enraged, you don't go out and take it on women, right? Uh, the women who have been vanquished, right? Why is this retaliation taking place on the body of the woman? So there's a whole phenomenology of rape because sometimes it's been argued, including by feminist historians, who while of course mindful of the fact that the, the pain is inflicted on the body of the woman, nonetheless will say that in fact, the rape of women, particularly at wartime, which is a very common problem, right, is usually a message being sent by the country that's the victor or that is in a position of superiority to the men of the other side saying, you are eunuchs, you're not even able to protect your women, right? So there's, there's a, it's a complicated argument. The rape cannot be simply be understood as only as a violation of a, the, the integrity of a woman and her body, right? But that in fact, it has wider implications. And that's why these, that's why the question of rape becomes quite important. What's important here also is that popular notions have described such atrocities to Soviet rather than American forces, right? Uh, but as she points out, Miriam Gebhardt, whatever the exact number, there is no culture of memory, no public recognition, much less an apology from the perpetrators that this has never really been talked about. Now the Nuremberg trials, we'll get to the Tokyo trials very quickly after this. Um, 22 senior level German political and military leaders were indicted. Um, the trials lasted from November, 1945 to October, 1946. Uh, several organizations were actually declared criminal organizations, which in effect meant that if you were a member of that organization, you were also a criminal. Uh, what organization? Simplest example, the SS, okay, the Gestapo, right? All of these organizations are declared as criminal, right? And most of the defendants were found guilty at this trial. Out of the 22, 10 were hanged. Goring, who was sort of the second most important person um, um, in Nazi Germany after Hitler, he was the head of the Luftwaffe, uh, the, the German Air Force, and he was a Reichsmarschall. Marshal. Um, you know, in fact, actually, um, when it was clear when the Allied troops had come into Berlin and just before Hitler committed suicide, because as all of you know, Hitler was uh, Hitler um, uh, and Eva Brown, his his um, you know his wife slash mistress, uh, they committed suicide uh, in the bunker, uh, so he didn't want to be taken alive, um, and be captured alive. That Goring actually had written a letter to Hitler just days before saying, can I take over charge of Nazi Germany now that it's clear that you're not in a position to do so? Um, and Hitler found that to be betrayal. He actually ordered Goring killed almost, but, but nonetheless, Hitler himself died a few days later. Goring is put on trial. Um, the night before the judgment, he commits suicide in his prison cell. Um, 10 of the 22 defendants were hanged. Uh, there were other trials at, as well. So when we say the Nuremberg trials, the reason it's in the plural is because most people know about the first major trial, but there were other trials and held, held uh, in other parts of Germany over the next several months. The doctor's trial, these were doctors who have been complicit um, in the Nazi, um, uh, you know, uh, um, a regime of extermination, the judges' trial, and trials of other lesser war criminals. What is interesting is how few people were actually tried. And all the 13 trials put together, you're really talking about hundreds. That's about it. Some hundreds of men, right? Tens of thousands of Nazis were just left off the hook. Why? Right? And, and one of the principal reasons is that when the war 
ended, another war had already started, the Cold War. And the Americans were quite certain in their mind that the greatest imperative now was to stop communism in its tracks, right? To impede the efforts of the Soviet Union to build up a new empire. Because what the, what the Americans and the Soviets both did was they set up their camps and then countries allied themselves either to the US or to, to the USSR, which were the two major geopolitical powers at the end of the war, at the end of the war. Right? So one of the consequences of the war was the fact that Britain's power is definitely going to diminish and therefore you're going to see decolonization. Britain is slowly going to lose all of its colonies. Right? So what I'm saying is that, um, the Americans knew that, look, you have to set up an anti-communist front. We're going to need the Nazis to help us do that, okay? Because whatever the sins and crimes of the Nazis, and there were plenty, right? Including principally, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the Holocaust perpetrated against the Jews, right? That notwithstanding these, the Americans were quite clear that one of the things that redeems the Nazis is the fact that they are ferociously anti-communist. And it is not generally known except to people who really have read um, in the history of the Holocaust and all of that, that the first concentration camp that was set up in Germany itself, Dachau, right? Which is, um, you know, in Munich, okay, um, Dachau, was not set up for the Jews. It was actually initially set up to, to put uh, in the camp, uh, and it was not initially an extermination camp, but basically it was set up to imprison for indefinite periods of time, labor union leaders and communists in Germany. Right? Um, and then eventually, of course, it became uh, a camp uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, became an extermination camp for the Jews as well, all right? So, so in other words, the Nazis, former Nazis were needed as allies. That's what we're really speaking about. That's one of the reasons why they were let off the hook, right? So the, the, their quote, good intentions ran up against the wall of reality. That's one way to think about it, right? But there was also the question that in some sense, the Americans understood, well, if you're gonna try a few thousand, why are we stopping at a few thousand? Because in fact, the whole country is implicit, is complicit. The whole country is complicit. So there's this very controversial book by Daniel Goldhagen called Hitler's Willing Executioners, which came out about 20 years ago, created a big stir, where essentially he's arguing that, in fact, there were millions of Germans who were complicit in this. And so, of course, by that logic, you could say that, well, there should have been tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands who should have been put on trial for war crimes, right? And then we also have to ask a question and we'll get to that. How does the trial of the Nazis compare with the trial of Japanese war criminals? So the Nuremberg principles are going to be established, the ones in bold, so that's what's gonna come out of the trial in terms of inter principles of international law and all of that. Uh, the, the, the ones that I want you to just look at here is the ones in bold, so there are seven principles uh, that a person who commits such a crime as a head of a state or government is not relieved from such responsibility. That you can't say that Hitler or, or Goring or whoever could not have said if they had been put on trial uh, as Goring was, uh, uh, but as remember, as I said, that he committed suicide anyhow, but cannot actually, cannot um, say that, look, I was the head of the state or the head of the government and therefore, I was simply carrying out policies that I had to in my official capacity, all right? Um, uh, this does not excuse a person from being responsible. Nor, and this, the most important really is this one over here, acting pursuant to superior orders does not relieve one from responsibility. That a mid-level official or even a high-level official who's still reporting to someone cannot excuse himself from saying for the crimes with which he is charged, if they have been proven to be true, cannot say that I was only carrying out orders, right? That the people who ran the German railways, which were used to transport Jews to the concentration camps, 
cannot simply say, well, I was simply carrying out the orders given by someone at the rights ministry, right? Or the railway minister. That is the crucial point over here, all right? Um, there are technicalities about, you know, what was international law? Uh, what, what if you're committing a crime that was really a crime only recognized under the domestic law of a country, but was not recognized as a crime under international law? So the Nuremberg principles try to deal with all of this, that crimes punishable under law include crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity. That if it is now argued that only crimes that were actually designated as crimes as such at the time that those crimes, alleged crimes were committed, right? That at that time, those alleged crimes were not designated as such. That does not excuse the person from the charge of having carried out crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, right? This is what it's going to do, what it's going to say. So there was a lot of criticism of Nuremberg. The chief American prosecutor himself wrote to President Truman in October 1945 that the Allies, quote, have done or are doing some of the very things that we're prosecuting the Germans for, right? Power was substituted for principle as the associate Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas declared. Law was declared ex post facto. Ex post facto, Latin for after the fact. Something I've spoken about before. A person is charged with a crime against humanity. When this alleged crime took place, let's say 1942, let's pick a random date, 1942, was that action designated as a crime under the existing law at that time? Or has it, is it the case that now the law has been framed after the crime has been committed and the person is now being tried under a law that was framed after the crime was committed. And therefore the implication being that at that from the point of view of existing law, it was not actually a crime at that time, right? So even American legal experts, including a Supreme Court justice, are saying that the law was actually created after the fact. All right, and that these proceedings were not done according to a court of law. The trial was fraudulent, it was argued. The rules of evidence were different, some said. So for example, give you an illustration, article 19 of the charter states that the tribunal shall not be bound by technical rules of evidence and shall admit any evidence which it deems to have probative value. Probative meaning that which can be proven, right? right? But of course, here, here the question simply was, the technical rules of evidence, you know, rules of evidence are very, very strict, which is why, for example, evidence collected illegally, even though no one might doubt the evidence, no one might doubt the evidence and every single person believes the evidence is true, but if the evidence is collected illegally, for example, it cannot be used in a court of law, right? What the tribunal's charter stipulated was, it shall not be bound by these technical rules of evidence. Right? And had, had, had Germany, had states agreed to the terms of the tribunal, had the country that had been vanquished, Germany, had Italy, the other country that was vanquished, had in Europe, right? had they agreed to the terms of the tribunal and to its jurisdiction. These were some of the criticisms that were raised. All right. Now, uh, let's look at let's look at the Tokyo war crimes trial. So something similar happened in the Far East. This is called the Tokyo war crimes trial. The difference is that there was no agreement, international agreement, as it was in the case of the tribunal at, at Nuremberg, right? It was not. This was not created. The IMTFE, International Military Tribunal for the Far East, was not created by international agreement, um, but it had a charter. It was essentially under the jurisdiction of the Americans. Why the Americans? Very simple, because at the end of the war in the Pacific, that is with Japan's surrender, unconditional surrender, the Japan came under American occupation. And therefore, 
essentially what happened was essentially under the jurisdiction of the Americans. All right. Now the Potsdam Declaration on July 1946, uh, 1945, sorry, signed by the US, UK and China demanded Japan's unconditional surrender and stated that stern justice shall be meted out to all war criminals, right? So something similar to what we saw in the case of Nuremberg, right? The Soviet Union had not yet declared war on Japan or, and therefore was not a signatory to the Potsdam Declaration. General Douglas MacArthur is a Supreme Command, Commanding Officer of the Allied Forces and therefore he is in a sense a person who decides how the tribunal is going to be shaped. He's not going to be the presiding officer or the president of the tribunal, but he's the one who really uh, was instrumental in giving shape to the tribunal. And he issues a special proclamation in his capacity as the Supreme Commanding Officer, as a person who's essentially running the occupation of Japan. And this charter of the tribunal is then annexed to the proclamation. This charter gives MacArthur the authority to appoint judges. Now here's a first big difference from Nuremberg. Nuremberg tribunal had only the major allied powers, right? In the case of the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, they were 11 justices or judges, 11, right? So one each, one each from the US, UK, Australia, Canada, China, France, the Netherlands, and New Zealand. And some of you might be thinking to yourself, hmm, why Australia? Why Canada? Why New Zealand? Well, Australia and New Zealand because the war was fought in the Pacific. And so Australia and New Zealand contributed a huge number of troops. Canada contributed troops, right? Okay. India and the Philippines are invited to join a bit later. Now that's very interesting. Cannot get into the complexities of that because of course India's position is completely anomalous. Unlike these, all these other countries, these countries here, right? With the exception of China, which because the other countries are white European powers, right? They're white European powers. They're undoubtedly on the side of the victors. China was not of course a European power. There was a civil war going on in China at this point in time. But of course, China had borne the brunt of the Japanese occupation. So it was, of course, quite logical that China would be represented. Uh, but China was not a colonized country in the way in which India was. Remember that when this trial takes place, India is still under colonial rule, right? So that's a really anomalous situation. Philippines was invited because Philippines had been brutalized by the Japanese. And then the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union declared war on Japan on the day that Hiroshima was bombed, right? And so therefore now the Soviet Union felt that it had a say in these matters as well. I, again, I'm, I'm really giving you the, the, the uh, you know, the surface reading because there's a very complex geopolitics going on. What is also, extraordinary about this tribunal in contrast to the one in Nuremberg is that the jurisdiction of the tribunal extended to crimes that occurred over a much larger period of time. See, Nuremberg is confined to ja German war crimes, crimes against peace, 1939 to 45. This tribunal in the Far East the period of time they're looking at begins with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria 1931 to Japan surrender in 1945. Now that already gives you an indication that something else is going on. That is that they are really looking to, pardon the colloquialism, screw the Japanese and saying, we're gonna take a much longer period of time, you know, to determine the nature of your criminal activities. So notice very carefully the contrasting jurisdiction here. That's what I'm saying to you. And there was a very important, one important aspect of the trial. There's an enormous discussions that take place at that time is a decision to exclude Emperor, the Emperor, Emperor Hirohito from the, the, the list of persons who are going to be tried. Because as in the case of the major trial, the showcase trial in the Nuremberg here, the showcase trial is a big trial, the first one in Tokyo, you take the major 
Japanese war criminals, you know, people who had run the government, people who were uh, the, the, the Japanese commanding officer in Nanking, all right? P military officials who could be held responsible for atrocities. But of course, the person who presides over all that is the emperor, but he's excluded. There's a lot of discussion. One of the, one of the things that was argued by the, by the Americans was, well, if we actually put the emperor on file, uh, we, are going to, we are going to essentially turn Japan into a permanent enemy. And what we need to do now is we need to enter a new phase whereby we need to see that Japan is on the bend. Japan has a constitution which doesn't allow it, right? We had a little discussion of that. You might remember, quote, a standing army. It does actually have a standing army. It's not called a standing army in the same way, but that Japan will not have an army that will prosecute wars, right? Offensive wars. It was, the constitution is going to forbid that. Um, uh, and we will want to create an ally in this part of the world as well, because of course they could see what was happening in China, that there's a civil war and the communists are likely to triumph over there. Right? So he's excluded, but again, it's a whole array of circumstances um, which led to Hirohito's exclusion from among those who were put on trial. So who is, the, who is the Indian judge? He's a judge who's a judge of the Calcutta High Court. I've already explained to you uh, why some countries were invited. Why was India invited? Because to join the tribunal and send one judge as each of the countries was sending one judge because India had played a substantial role by contributing troops to the war. And of course it was very clear that that India's independence was on the horizon and that India probably would in years ahead constitute a major player in that part of the world. Right? These were some of the principal reasons. But I've explained what was paradoxical, paradoxical about India's position on the tribunal, namely that it was a country that itself was colonized. It was not an independent country. All right. And did, did Radha Vinod Pal have qualifications as an expert in international law? No. But let us be very clear, almost no one did on the tribunal. Almost no one did. Some people have tried to critique Pal. We'll see why Pal has come in for more criticism because uh, just to tell you straight off the bat, he is going to issue a massive dissenting judgment, right? It runs into 800 pages. So therefore he has come in for a bit more criticism uh, and some people have said, well, he didn't have the qualifications. Well, he was a judge. He was not a specialist in international law, but almost no one on the tribunal law was, partly because international law was not a well-developed field 75 years ago. Did he encounter racism at the proceedings? There's some evidence that he did. So when he, when he comes, he joins, he, you know, because India was invited a little bit late in the day, so the trial had pretty much started almost by the time that Radha Binod Pal arrives in Tokyo uh, to represent India. Uh, and he is put in a different hotel than everyone else. Right? And this is something that he actually quite objects to. Um, uh, what was his relationship to the other judges on the court? Very interesting set of questions. Uh, you know, if you look at photographs, you see that he's seated on the side, on the extreme side. There's a Dutch judge next to him who also issued a dissenting judgment, not as voluminous, of course, as, as Pals. Uh, it's very clear that there were certain, if I may put it this way, certain cabals within the tribunal. The principal cabal was formed by the Australian judge who was the president of the tribunal, tribunal William Webb, um, and, and uh, the Anglophone countries, in a sense, stuck together. So Australia, Canada, New Zealand, United Kingdom, the United States, there's some evidence that they stuck together, but partly it had to do with legal reasons too, because they all had a similar legal system emerging from notions of English common law. The French traditions of justice, the Russian traditions, the Chinese, were all quite different, right? That's, those are some of the considerations. So he issues a dissenting judgment. 
he is going to object, we're going to return to it again. I'm giving you the broader framework. He objects to the fact that colonialism has not been brought into the pictures. He wants to know just precisely how all of these crimes that the Japanese war criminals are being tried with, crimes against peace, crimes against humanity, crimes of aggression, how these are different from the crimes of colonialism, right? And he, he argues that the people who are putting these, the Japanese on trial, the countries that are putting the Japanese on trial are themselves responsible for some of the worst atrocities. Atrocities committed, in fact, he says, not during war even necessarily, but even in times of peace. And so therefore he's talking about crimes against colonized people, right? Uh, he objects that charges are ex post facto. I've already explained what that means. He notices that some of the crimes had been sensationalized, right? He says there's been a lot of propaganda. There's been, you know, that the Japanese war crimes have been exaggerated by some people, he argues. He did not question that these crimes had taken place, but wondered whether they had been exaggerated. The rape of Nanking would be perhaps, I think, the best example. You know, I mean, um, there's probably not very many of you. There may be a few who know that there was a writer, uh, Iris Chang, who wrote a book about 20 years ago. Uh, again, a very sensational book, made her world famous, The Rape of Nanking, where she, where she uh, you know, talks about this. She herself, by the way, committed suicide a few years later, because that tells you, by the way, that when you study subjects such as like this, you become traumatized yourself sometimes, and some researchers cannot handle this. It's a very interesting problem to think about, all right? Um, but uh, it has it. It can be argued that one of the things she did was she sensationalized it. So she gives figures like 200, 250,000 people. She says were killed. Now there are other scholars who are saying that the entire population of Nanking wasn't even 200,000 at that point in time, and it's not not the case that no one came out of it. And so Pyle, in fact, is already anticipating all of this in his judgment suggesting why we're going to have to scrutinize this evidence very, very carefully. His judgment runs to 800 pages. It is banned in Japan at once by the American occupation authorities. They ban it, right? Um, and what's fantastic is that the very day that the occupation was lifted a few years later, that same day, the judgment is published. Right? Because once the occupation is over, the ban is automatically lifted. They already had the judgment, the people who were who said this judgment really need to be circulated, they already had a supply and they immediately brought it out. Right? They thought that Pal is in fact actually exonerating the Japanese, saying that you haven't committed any crimes that you and therefore you're acquitted. Right? And he is going to be celebrated throughout the country. That's why you see his memorial at the Yasukuni Shrine. And in Tokyo, he's going to twice return to Japan after the end of the war as a guest of the Japanese people. He's going to be conferred with state honors. And he is absolutely revered by the militaristic right. However, unusually, even the Japanese left holds them in high regard, even while they critique Japanese nationalism. The reason for that, of course, is his critique of colonialism. Right? his critique of colonialism. And he's very clear, he critiques not just British and French colonialism, he critiques Japanese colonialism. All right, now, we, I wish I had time to keep on going on, um, but I really do want to just spend a few more minutes on Pal because I will suggest that you read all of this very carefully yourself. Uh, there are lots of criticisms that have been voiced of the Tokyo war crimes tribunal, the prejudice of the, of the, the presiding, um, um, you know, the president who presided over it, William Webb, um, you know, the arrogance with which he often spoke to uh, the defense uh, uh, witnesses and the, the counsel for the defense, uh, right? All of this has been mentioned. Uh, I've already indicated that many of the judges had no background in international law. In fact, the Chinese judge was not even a judge. He was not even a judge, right? The Russian judge knew neither English or Japanese. The two official languages of the trial are English or Japanese. So he always needed uh, 
a whole team of translators. And there's a fascinating set of questions about what is the place of translation here and translation both literally, metaphorically, culturally, right? Um, how are ideas being translated across so many different cultures? And because this is really the first tribunal of its kind in the world. I mean, 11 justices representing 11 countries, right? And several substantially different cultures. The proceedings take place over a very long period of time. The attitude is quite lax. The president of the tribunal is absent for 22 consecutive days from November 12th to December 12th. He doesn't even hear the evidence for 22 days. Paul himself is absent for more than 80 days out of the 417 days during which the trial was actually held. Partly he came late, then he had to go back to India a number of times. His wife was really sick, right? All kinds of considerations. Um, and the judges dissented for all kinds of reasons, many of which you can now anticipate. So there is a majority opinion. Because it was a majority opinion, most of the Japanese who were tried were convicted, and most of them were sentenced to death. But there were separate dissenting opinions and separate opinions which agreed with the majority, but also pointed to some points of difference, right? So, so they are they are concurring opinions. There's a majority opinion, there's concurring opinion, and then there are dissenting opinions. The most famous dissenting opinion, of course, being one of Krada Binotal. Uh, the Filipino judge, for example, thought that the sentences were far too lenient. Um, uh, well, it's difficult to surmise what he means by lenient when more than half of the people had been sentenced to death and the sentences were, were carried out. Uh, but he thought that the others should have been sentenced to death as well. And as in the case of Nuremberg, we're not speaking about one single trial. This is the showcase trial, the big one. This is the, the, this is the, the criminals who are judged to have carried out the greatest atrocities, but there are going to be a whole series of other trials not all held in Tokyo, some held in other parts of Japan, some held actually in other countries as well, okay? Not all held, and some held in the Philippines, for example. Not all of them were held in Japan either, right? Um, now, Justice Paul says, quote, I would hold that each and every one of the accused must be found not guilty of each and every one of the charges in the indictment and should be acquitted on all those charges, end quote. So was he exonerating the Japanese? Was he saying, well, no, you haven't committed any crimes at all because he said, right, that must be found not guilty of each and every one of the charges in the indictment. And yet he says at the same time, and this is what reveals his position in the same judgment, the evidence is still overwhelming that atrocities were perpetrated by the members of the Japanese armed forces against the civilian population of some of the territories occupied by them as also against prisoners of war. That it's not only atrocities committed against civilians by the Japanese armed forces, but it's their treatment of prisoners of war. So how do we interpret the judgment? What more can we say about it? He, of course, objected to the ex post facto nature of the charges. In other words, the charges for which they were charged, the crimes for which they were charged were not recognized as crimes at the time that they were committed. He questioned the absence of judges from vanquished countries. And it's an interesting thought that there should have been a Japanese judge too. There should have been a judge maybe from even from Germany, because there was wartime collaboration between the Germans and the Japanese, right? He's saying that this is the only way in which we can actually conduct a fair trial. He's saying there's selective prosecution of even the crimes perpetrated by the Japanese. Forget about the crimes perpetrated by the Americans and the British. The bombing of Chinese cities is not an indictment. It's not mentioned in the indictment. Bombing of Chinese cities by the Japanese why? Because the Americans knew that the minute you did that, then the Japanese, the bombing of Japanese cities by the Americans, the carpet fire bombing, which meant, went on for months and essentially left most Japanese cities 
not just in ruins, but in large fires that burned for months that the Americans could then be put on trial for this, right? And, you know, he actually takes an aerial trip of Hiroshima. He takes an aerial trip of Hiroshima. He sees the atomic bombing and its consequences because, as you know, from not just from my video lectures and, you know, but from other material that Hiroshima was leveled, right? So there's this atomic do dome. There's this building, that one building which survived in ruins and it is still preserved. It's now a, a shrine to peace in a way. Right? But the city had been completely leveled as far as the eye could see. And he's clearly moved by that. Right? And he is very clear that this is, in fact, a crime against humanity, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so, therefore, it's questionable to him whether the prosecutors had any moral claim to hold the trial. He sees the trials as retaliation out of which little if any good would emerge. And the last slide here, two further considerations. Was there racism in the administration of justice? To be absolutely concise about it, the number of Japanese who were tried and convicted and the kinds of sentences they were given, that is the severity of the sentences far outstrips what was administered to the Germans. The, 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 the number of people tried, much greater number of Japanese and Germans, the severity of the crimes, the, sorry, the severity of the punishment, all of this, suggesting that the German war criminals and Japanese war criminals were not viewed in the same way. One recent outcome of these trials, you could say, is the International Criminal Court. Astonishingly, it only comes into existence in 2002. There is a Rome Treaty that brought it into existence in 1998. More astonishingly, there are 190 countries in the world, only 123 countries are members. Which prominent countries are not? The US is not a signatory to this. Okay, It initially signed the treaty. It was never ratified because the, by the Senate because the US eventually withdrew. Russia, China, India, none of these countries is a signatory. Why not? Precisely because if you look at what happened in Nuremberg and Tokyo, if the US, if Russia prosecutes a war, which is viewed as a war that is illegal, the president of the United States in principle could be brought to trial before the International Criminal Court. Remember the Nuremberg principles, that having an official position as a head of state when you're carrying out the war does not save you from responsibility for crimes committed during the war. Right? So the US said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna subject ourselves to be being brought into the criminal International Criminal Court, and particularly by countries such as Syria or Iraq or Sudan, which are you know run by tin pot dictators, and we are not going to have these small little countries bring our mighty leaders to court for crimes. That's the reason why, and it is not an accident that virtually all the prosecutions that have been carried out by this International Criminal Court are of African leaders charged with crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, right? And why Africans? Because of course, African states are the least powerful in the international state system that we have. 